like to say that I'm very excited to be here, very happy to be here where my beginnings are. This is an institution where I started getting interested in issues of academic writing, and uh, I'm still uh, working in that area. Um, and I also would like to uh, help uh, thank all my colleagues from the Center of Academic Writing, or the Language Teaching Center, as we used to be called when we were in the cave. <laughs> and also thanks to everybody here showing up on the third day of the conference, 9 o'clock. I really appreciate that. <laughs> So my topic is about culture. It's a huge, massive topic. There's, there's an enormous amount of literature. And I almost regretted choosing this topic. Uh, and obviously, in this uh, talk, I can't go over a lot of the things. So I, I apologize in, in, in advance if I'm not going to address some of the issues that you have in mind when you think of culture. It's going to be a very selective overview of ideas that I think have some relevance for academic writing, uh, pedagogy, and research. Where do I point this? Oh. You get it back. Ah, right, maybe this way. Yes, okay. So as I was preparing the talk, uh, one thing that kept coming back to my mind is the story by Raymond Carver, what we talk about when we talk about love. Um, a lot of you have read this story, so just a very brief reminder. In the story, there are two middle-aged couples who sit around, drink a lot of gin, and as they slowly get drunk, they talk about love. And it transpires that actually their ideas about love are quite different. Uh, so I thought, well, culture is, in, the, in some sense, it's very similar to love. We, we, we talk about it a lot. We all like to use this word. But if we dig down into what we actually mean, we'll probably come up with very different things. And there is an activity I'd like to share with you, which I, I, I got from a colleague of mine, who asked her students over a week to note down every time they or somebody else uses the word culture in everyday life, or maybe in the media, or maybe in uh, something they are reading. And then after a week, they sit down and they discuss these, these uses of the word culture, and they try, they try to replace them, uh, to, to replace the word by, by another word. I tried the same, and I recommend you try it. It's really interesting. These are some of the things that came up. So in most cases, people talk about countries, actually, when, when they talk about culture. They also talk about national or ethnic groups. They talk about institutions. Traditions, ways of speaking, custom, personality even, education, knowledge. Very often it's a good word to avoid talking about religion. <laughs> <laughs> and very often it's just a vague combination of some of these meanings. So it's, it's a super word. We can use it for all kinds of things and we sort of understand what we mean. Um, and actually in scholarly uh, definitions of culture, this has been noted as well. It's a fuzzy concept. It's hard to define, it's very slippery, so obviously that's a problem in scholarly work. So that's why people have had problems to define it. In 1952, there was an attempt to identify definitions of culture. The number then, of the catalog definitions, was 146. So we can imagine how many more definitions came up as the world changes uh, since then. Uh, and we're coming to the point where, as Srikan Sarangi has said, the term culture means what we want it to mean in specific con con context of use. Obviously, not a very ideal situation uh, if we want to know exactly what we mean. <laughs> now, one of the reasons why this is the case is that culture is really of interest to a, a range of different disciplines. Uh, here I've just listed some of them, starting with anthropology as the study of culture, but also to other disciplines. And if we think of just one of these areas, and I've chosen linguistics as sort of the closest <coughs> to us, and uh, uh, studies of writing, we can see a lot of areas where culture has some relevance. So each of these areas will have a particular interest in culture, a particular methodology of studying it, and obviously then a particular definition of culture. So how do we talk across disciplines? Now this is not the only problem with the term culture. Uh, there are some problems with uh, the term itself. Uh, there is a lot written about this in anthropology, and it all started back in the 70s with uh, the questioning of anthropology as a, as a post-colonial science. And I'm not going to go through all of that, but I'll just pick some of the issues that I think are uh, important for us. One of the critiques was uh, uh, targeted at the idea, at the assumption of sharingness. So if you look at these definitions of culture, many will have explicit or implicit idea that something is shared. It's a shared way of life, or it's a shared set of beliefs, assumptions, behavior, and so on. And as anthropologists have said, the moment you say that something is shared, you stop asking a lot of very important questions, such as, is it really shared by everybody in the community? 
Uh, if not, what happens to these other ones? Do they have to accommodate? Do they resist? Uh, how come things get to, to be shared? Whose values were they initially? So all of this suddenly disappears. And we imply consensus by the idea of sharedness. And once we do that, it becomes something that's deterministic. So you say that somebody's from that culture, oh, that means they are like this and like this and like that. Mm -hmm. like that. And here's a little vignette I'd like to share. Uh, I have a, a, a friend who I see occasionally, maybe five years or so, and I saw her a few months ago. She is an academic in a very different field, and her daughter had just started working as a, as a text editor. And she's a freelance text editor, she has a website, and then she works with writers from all kinds of disciplines um, everywhere, Europe and, and wider. So I was very interested, and I kept asking, so what kind of difficulties she comes across, and how, how does it work? And she said, oh, it's really good. But at one point, she said this. <laughs> it's a perfect illustration of this sharing. So she saw some manuscripts by writers from this region, and they were incoherent. So yes, all of them are incoherent. But what I also find interesting here is the first part. Apology. Why is she apologizing? <laughs> well, OK, I'm from this region. It must be I'm an incoherent writer. Now, can we think of sharedness in a different way? And I'd like to, here to share with you uh, a metaphor that um, was introduced by uh, somebody who comes from my own uh, country, but he is not an incoherent writer, uh, <laughs> Vladimir Zhigarets, who says, well, we should think of culture as an epidemic. Every epidemic, we kind of know what the boundaries are. The public health authorities have to determine the boundaries. But not everybody will be affected. Even in the hotspots, there will be people who are not affected. Some will have milder symptoms. Some will perhaps die. So <laughs> culture is very similar to that. Um, another idea of thinking about culture is to think of it as a resource that people can tap into. Uh, but we have differing access, uh, levels of access to this resource. And sometimes it's not, it's not by choice, which brings ideas of uh, ideology to mind as well. OK, some other problems with the term culture. Another uh, idea that we've received a lot of criticism in the literature is the idea that culture is something real, uh, a reality. Uh, and this has been something that came through a process of reification. In other words, the first introduction of the word culture was as a term to help us understand social groupings. Uh, but then, gradually, it came to be seen something uh, that exists outside of our, uh, not as a human product, but something that really is, uh, has its own uh, entity. So it has started to be seen as a cause of behavior. So we talk about students because of their culture. They do this or they do that. Also, it's seen as an agent. So cultures can clash um, and so on. And eventually, that leads to a very uh, simpli simplified view of others. In other words, a reductionist overgeneralization and process of otherization. In other words, we see others in these very simple terms. But if, you, if they ask us about our own culture, it's much more complex. You say, well, you know, like this, but not really, because I know some people who are different. It's much more difficult to say what we are like. So what uh, this comes down to is essentialism. We, we, we identify certain essential traits in others, which we then use as a defining feature of this, of this other group. And we then apply them to individuals. Ah, Southwest of Europe, incoherent writer. <laughs> Another set of critiques which I can't get into is uh, the fact that the notion of culture is closely related to the concept of nation, which, as you know, has received a lot of criticism itself. Uh, Anderson has famously said that nation is an imagined community. So we, if we have a concept which is related to an imagined concept, then we are going through a second level of construction. Very problematic. OK, here, I'm, I'm just showing you this very briefly. I can't go through all of this, but I thought it's a very nice way to show how we can talk about cultures in an essentialist and a non-essentialist way. This comes from Holiday Hyde and Kuhlman. Uh, so they've identified different aspects of cultures. So we can talk about a culture as a, something that has a physical entity. It is associated with a country, language. Uh, people in one culture just are just there. They can't move. Uh, and uh, they're very different from others. And people's behavior is defined and constrained by the culture in which they live, because we think of it as a place. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the traditional, the received notion of culture, which we all use, because it's easy to make to use stereotypes um, uh, about people. Uh, but a non-essentialist view of culture would think of it as something that is uh, in flux, 
uh, changing, much more complex. Uh, we can think of people belonging to many different communities. Uh, we can talk about cultures of food or cafe cultures rather than these totalizing uses of the word culture. Okay, so today, in most social sciences, what are the options for the term culture? Some scholars say, forget about it. We're not going to use it. It's a, too, it's a, it's a problem term. Let's just get, get away with it. And they have tried to replace it with other terms. Uh, identity seems to be the most popular one. Not, not unproblematic, but it seems to be doing the job. Uh, some people refer to context, or they talk about discourses. Again, this will depend on the discipline. <coughs> Others have tried to say, okay, well, let's just regard the culture as really what it is. It's a tool. It's merely an analytical tool. And as ethnographers today would agree with this statement from Bauman, which says, culture is not a real thing. It's an abstract and purely analytical notion. It doesn't cause behavior. It summarizes an abstraction from it. And it's thus neither normative nor predictive. And a famous statement by Brian Street uh, that culture is a verb, has also had a lot of influence. In other words, he's saying that culture is something that's a process, that's an activity. Again, a statement from Baumann here, a process of making and remaking collective sense of changing social facts. So moving on to try to define what culture does, which comes from Thornton, an anthropologist, who said we shouldn't define what culture is, but what culture does. Scullin, Scullin and Rodney, see culture as a heuristic, as a tool for thinking, which I think is a very useful way to use it in our field as well. And they give a very interesting definition. I really like this, and I'm, I hope you will like it too. So culture is a way of dividing people up into groups according to some feature of these people, which helps us understand something about them and how they're different from or similar to other people. It's a very different definition from the ones that we uh, usually use. And it's quite broad, actually, and, and quite useful, as we'll see uh, in a minute. One article that really, really opened my eyes about cultures is uh, <coughs> the article Small Cultures by Adrian Holiday, uh, published in 1999 in Applied Linguistics. And he introduces here the idea of different paradigms. The, the large culture paradigm, which is a traditional view, the received notion of culture, cultures as ethnic national groups, uh, which were all familiar with, and he identifies some of the problems that I've talked about in this notion of culture. One of the problems is that it's defined a priori. So we first say, these are Germans, these are Italians, let me see how they, how they write. Okay? But we defined it to begin with. Opposite to that is the small culture paradigm, which starts with, let's see what happens in this particular group. I'm going to look at any kind of cohesive group, social grouping, and I'm going to try to see what is, going, what is relevant in this particular group. <coughs> so it's emergent in nature. We don't define it before we start research or, or thinking about culture. We focus on the processes that go on in that particular context. Uh, but we know, we are very much aware that members of this culture will bring with themselves all kinds of cultural residues, as Holiday calls them. Some of these residues will be national cultural residues. But not all of them. There will be professional residuals and so on. Thinking of our field, a perfect example of a small culture is the writing center. Uh, our basement <laughs> was a very different kind of unit we, with very different relationships among colleagues, between colleagues and students. Uh, very different from a department culture. I know very well because I moved from a writing center to, to a department. Uh, and the transition was a very difficult one because everything was different. It was equally difficult as moving from Hungary to the UK. Okay, so what does this all mean for uh, academic writing, research, and pedagogy? And I have to refer to contrastive rhetoric as the field that closely looks at how cultural differences uh, uh, appear in writing. And I'm sure we're all familiar with this field. And we can see a similar trajectory, somewhat delayed, as in the other fields. Um, Starting with the initial article from 66, Kaplan's doodles, as he called them later, uh, which I'm sure I'll probably share everybody else's experience here, that first when you saw this, you were thought, oh yes, amazing, this explains everything. And then going through a phase of thinking, well, it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, one of the problems that a lot of people have pointed out is that these ideas led to very essentialist views of cultures in writing and students. Things like these were often heard 
similar things. I'm sure you've all seen that. So a simplistic way of understanding things. And also what is interesting is that we adopted Kaplan's views uh, or ideas initially to even talk about our own writing. In my culture, we don't do this or we don't do that. Uh, Holiday says that any statements like this should be taken as artifacts of culture. In other words, they're not descriptions of what really happens in that person's writing. Because that person is a professional in a particular field, they have a particular experience of writing, so it's their own perception of their language and the ways of writing, not a description of everybody in their culture writing that way. That's very important to, to think about. Of course, there's an enormous literature, critical literature, uh, that uh, has attacked contrastive rhetoric, some of it very fiercely, but it all helped to move the field a little bit further. Uh, I've just noticed, noticed some of the studies here, and you will see that 97 was a particularly bad year for contrastive rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> so if, that, if it could survive that, then it probably can survive everything. And you will see that the, uh, the, the criticisms were about all sorts of issues, methodological flaws in early contrastive rhetoric research, uh, pedagogical implications or lack of them, but primarily the criticism was about the underlying conception of culture. So we go back to the issue of culture. Now recent efforts to reconceptualize contrastive rhetoric uh, have gone in the, in the direction of changing the, the term, first of all. So instead of contrastive, which looks at two things and contrast, we're now trying to move into something that's inter, uh, so something that's between, uh, and we there are new definitions, so we can see in uh, Ulla Connor's latest definition of uh, intercultural uh, uh, rhetoric, written discourse between and among individuals with different cultural backgrounds. Uh, so there are attempts there. There is a lot of work on the development of criteria for compar comparability of texts, so the methodology is much more robust. We're not comparing expert writing in English with student writing in English as a second language. Obviously, uh, that's not going to help us uh, understand cultural differences. And there is a, a call for uh, scholars to look not just at texts, but also context of writing, context of using of texts, and also perspectives of writers and readers. Uh, and there is a lot of research coming up that does that. I'm going to just give you an example of one study that I know very well because I was a supervisor. Uh, this is a, a Japanese young scholar who now works at the Writing Center at Waseda University in Tokyo. And she was originally interested in how PhD theses in Britain and in Japan differ in the field of literature, literary studies, particularly looking at macrostructures and introductory chapters. So you can see, okay, this is the received culture approach. I look at Japan, I look at Britain. Then she did a pilot study in which she collected some texts and she also interviewed, interviewed some PhD supervisors. And she was really surprised when she found out that many Japanese theses didn't have an abstract. She's from Japan, she didn't know that. She was really shocked because she was a PhD student in Britain. Then she did some interviews and she heard that actually students do write an abstract, but it's not, they're not required to put it in the thesis. It actually goes to the administration and it has a completely different role for examination purposes, for library cataloging purposes. So the, the genre which we thought was the same actually wasn't the same in terms of its communicative purpose. Would it make sense to just look at the moves and steps? Probably not, because they do something different in these different contexts. Okay, so this is something, I, I won't bore you with lots of numbers, but this is just what she then found. I want to point out that she looked at not just one university, because that would be wrong. Assuming that one country can be represented by one particular university would be problematic. So she looked at three universities in the UK and in Japan, and she spent a lot of time trying to match, match them in the same way as we would match texts. So she tried to find departments of a similar size, similar kind of ranking, and also doing similar kinds of literature studies, because there are all kinds of literature studies that you could do, comparative, uh, theory-based, and so on. Interestingly, she found uh, that not all the theses follow the same pattern. So in Japan, there were some theses only from one university that did have an abstract. And in the UK, one of the universities, less than, 100%, less than half of them actually didn't have an abstract. So clearly, what came out here is that, although she studied with looking at cross-cultural differences, these inter-institutional differences became really important. And then we can see that we can't just make a blanket statement about differences between cultures, because things are much more complex 
<coughs> okay, going back to intercultural rhetoric, what is the future of this field? One of my favorite articles on this topic is Matsuda and Atkinson, 2008, which is actually an academic conversation. I don't know if you're familiar with this text. If you are not, I recommend you have a look. They basically sit down, drink beer, and talk. Uh, and it's very spontaneous, and you can, you can see it in the discussion. But it's also a serious discussion. Uh, I think we should have more of these kinds of genres uh, in our field. And I talked to Lisa about potentially having uh, something like that in the, in the journal, in the dialogue section. Uh, so at one point I talk about, well, what's going to be the future? And uh, Paul actually said, well, I see two parts. One is that the field should really broaden up. It should start by including not just text, but also traditions of rhetoric in different societies, and uh, history of writing, and history of education, teaching writing, and all kinds of things. And we also need a stronger conceptual base, basis. We need a more complex conceptualization of culture. The other possibility is that whatever contrastive rhetoric covers today can just be spread around under existing labels. A lot of it is actually genre analysis that looks at the two languages. Fine, it doesn't actually need to even go under the label of contrastive rhetoric. And I think actually, this was in 2008, but I think we see both of these going parallel to one another in a way. Uh, Connor and colleagues are working on this. We see efforts to open up uh, intercultural rhetoric, but still there is no critical mass of scholars who would say, I'm an intercultural rhetorician. So the field is not yet there, my feeling uh, is this way. And the other, on the other side, we, we have a lot of scholars who work in, who look at contrast cross-cultural or, or cross-linguistic, let's say, studies of different genres in two languages, but they don't refer to the literature in contrastive rhetoric. So they, they see themselves as genre analysts or discourse analysts which is also uh, uh, obviously fine. So we need further work, particularly how do we connect what we know from these studies, how, what, what implication does it have for teaching? And also, what is culture? We still need to address this issue. How do we theorize culture? Uh, lots of questions still remain. Primarily, is culture still relevant? Or should we abandon it, as some scholars are arguing, if it's relevant? How can we understand it so that we avoid essentializing others? Uh, we often work with students whose first language is a different language from others. But we don't want to end up being essentialist. And how can we use findings of any of this work in pedagogical practice? Uh, so here is uh, something that I've noticed about culture at Ito. <coughs> about 10% of the presentations had culture in title. <laughs> Clearly, it's relevant. Mine included, obviously. <laughs> the book of abstracts. Almost 90 times you see the word culture. In presentations, I've heard lots of mentions uh, of the word culture. But if you look how the word is used, we see diverse patterns of use. People mean really different things when they use the word culture. So it's used in different ways for different purposes. And we go back to Sarangi's statement, people use it for what they want it uh, to mean. But it also means we clearly need to talk about different things that we consider to be part of culture. So this is a, a little framework that I'm thinking of that would be useful. It would be useful to think of what types of culture are relevant to academic writing. Uh, <coughs> Starting from some initial assumptions. First, that writing is a social act. We always write in a particular social environment, in a response to a social situation, with a particular reader or audience in mind. We deal with writers as much as with text, maybe more with writers than with text. We've seen that there are problems with the traditional notion of culture. We can't ignore them. We have to somehow address them. And I think this is a very useful idea, that culture is a tool for thinking. And also, this is a term I borrowed from chemistry, culture is a polyvalent term. It interacts with other terms. And I think this is very useful. We can use this very much. If we can't define culture, we can try and define the modifier that we use with culture. OK, so if you want to focus on small local cultures following Holiday's uh, paradigm, then these seem to be the most relevant ones to me at this moment. But there could be others that are also very relevant. Institutional, learning, and disciplinary cultures. And I'll say a few words about each of these. But I have to say, a lot of people referred to these cultures uh, in the talks uh, already today. 
Institutional culture also goes under the, the guise of workplace culture, organizational culture. There's an enormous literature in management studies and organizational studies about this. Um, in education studies as well, schools and universities are a type of institution, so a lot of research already uses this term and there's quite a big literature. We, we should look at that and we should use it uh, when we talk about writing. Basically what this means, it means how things get done in institutions, what are the values, what are the assumptions behind the practices. <coughs> if we think of writing, one area where we can see a lot of things that uh, are the influence writing is rules and regulations. And these affect both students and, and researchers in institutions. Just think of these things, plagiarism policies, departmental guidelines, how long a text should be, what kind of structure should you have, what citation style should be used how much feedback is allowed, and so on and so forth. So all of these are very important factors uh, that shape student writing, and they will differ from institution to institution. For researchers, equally, there are policies about how much they should publish, should they publish in English or not, we've heard a lot about that. Um, in, where should they publish? Some institutions prescribe a list of journals where people should publish, uh, or what kind of, for example, in my institution, Writing a monograph doesn't count at all. You have to write journal articles. Book chapters don't count. So it's a very constraining uh, factor uh, where you work. If I move to another university, it could be a different thing. OK, but the question to really look at is how fixed are these rules? Can they be negotiated? Can they be bended? Who do you discuss these rules with? Who decides? I think this is very uh, often the case that we've all had situations where, let's say, there is a policy about deadlines. OK, so in my institution, the deadline cannot be negotiated with a lecturer. Uh, if a student needs to miss a deadline, they have to fill in a form, the form goes to a panel, the panel discusses, and so on. Uh, every year, students come to you and say, well, can I, can I submit a little bit later? <laughs> I'm, I'm really, I wasn't, I wasn't okay. And you said, yeah, we're just filling the form. But they really assume that, no, rules are there, but they are not there to be followed. You negotiate with people. <laughs> and maybe they're bringing with them practices which were common in their own institution. And they just assume it must be the same. So this is what we mean a different in institutional culture. There are also unwritten conventions, unwritten uh, expectations that are very difficult for students to decipher. And also two other factors. In terms of writing, um, first of all, is there any writing support? In what form does the writing support exist? Some places have writing centers, others have courses. This will all affect students' writing. What technologies for writing are available? What assessment systems exist? Is it, basically, is it mostly oral assessment or is it written assessment? Ethnographies and case studies are very useful for looking into institutional cultures because they really go into the depth of all of these factors, uh, some of which the researcher may not know because the researcher is also a stranger to an institutional culture where they don't work. And uh, here I'm just uh, listing some studies that are, are quite interesting. This one I'm sure a lot of you know. A study of different writing cultures in two different writing programs within the same institution. One aimed at native speaker writers, another at uh, non-native speaker writers. Completely different ideologies. Uh, and a uh, uh, work by uh, Teresa Lillis, who is here, and uh, Mary Jane Curry about publishing practices of scholars in four different countries and how the institutional framework and uh, wider ministerial policies and so on uh, have an effect on, on uh, the writing of scholars. Uh, so we need more work of this kind so we can actually see what is going on in different institutions. Okay, now to the learning culture concept. Uh, this would mean practices, values, and assumptions about the ways of learning and teaching. What counts as the best methodology? Uh, what, do we believe that learning is best if it's based on road learning or discovery learning? Uh, what is an effective classroom activity? What evaluation systems and assessment criteria are used? Uh, and very importantly, what, what are the roles expected of teachers and learners? These are not written. Uh, so students really don't know. And they're important because they have an effect on the issue of independence and autonomy. How much do we expect students? We often say, oh, students are not dependent. No, not independent. They're really terrible. But actually, they may come from a learning culture where that's the norm. So switching to a new culture is quite difficult for them. Practices appear to be normal and natural to the insiders, but they may, they may seem quite strange to newcomers. And this is equally true of students and new, new staff who come to new uh, uh, learning cultures. 
my favorite example is peer feedback. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you had this kind of experience. Students come to a writing class and they're asked to do peer feedback and they say, peer feedback? Why? I want to learn from the teacher. Why should I learn from another person? And then slowly they, they learn how they can actually uh, learn from other students. Disciplinary cultures, I won't talk much about because a lot of people have talked about this uh, uh, at this conference. Uh, there is a lot of research on how disciplines differ, not just in bodies of long, uh, knowledge and methodologies and worldviews, but also in discourses. And a lot of things have been studied. How we make claims in different dis disciplines, what counts as evidence, what counts as argument, how writers represent themselves sexually, and so on and so forth. And a lot of differences have been found. Uh, well, we know that students are not yet members of a disciplinary culture, so we can't really say that this is a small culture where they belong. So I would call this departmental disciplinary <coughs> culture. And they would, uh, if we think of departments of, let's say, biology, biology departments across institutions will have something that in common, but they will also slightly differ. So they may have a similar kind of assignment, and I think Otto was talking about plant biography or <laughs> some other interesting genre in biology. Uh, which is very specific to the discipline, but maybe in a different dip discipline of bio uh, department of biology, they will be doing something else. Okay, now all of these small cultures are obviously not independent of each other. They overlap, they intersect, and um, interact with one another. And importantly, they're not in a hierarchical order with the national culture. As we've seen from the study by Ono, Japan, and uh, we could not assume from the national characteristic that all institutions will follow one national rule. It just doesn't happen that way. And it's also important to always keep in mind that individuals participate in multiple small cultures. Where it's particularly important to look at these issues is when people make cultural transitions. And we make cultural transitions, transitions all the time, all of us. Uh, and I think in the future, being able to make a smooth cultural transition will be increasingly important. Because we all move quite a lot. Uh, people change jobs a lot. Uh, people go back to study and come back and, and so on. So this is really becoming a, a very important skill, so to speak. Uh, and here, I'll skip this, because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but I'll just say for teachers dealing with students who are newcomers, it's not unimportant to know about students' national backgrounds. But that's not the whole story. It's much more important to know what kind of institution they come from and what kind of learning culture they come from. And we shouldn't assume that from the national background because we know that all countries now have a much more diversi diversified educational systems and within the same country you will find a very traditional university and a completely uh, different kind of university. This, these are some examples of possible transitions that people make and what is interesting is that Transitions are not just uh, temporal, <laughs> such as secondary school to university, big transition. Your undergraduate, postgraduate, again, big transition in terms of writing. But also, people move back, back and forth. I've certainly seen much more of that. The students will go to work where they are required to write in different ways. They, they come back to university, and then they, they have to re enculturate themselves to, to being a student again. People also, it's much more common that people go from discipline A to discipline B. Um, my master's students often come to apply linguistics with completely different backgrounds. Uh, I had a student who did uh, legal studies. His first assignment was like this. 1.1, definition. 1.1.1. <laughs> it was all single sentences. Legal writing, uh, not uh, applied linguistics. People tend to go from single disciplines to interdisciplinary fields, more and more so. Again, we see that in, in all these universities. Within the same country, students could move from a state to a private university or vice versa with different practices, from a university that uses the local lang language as a medium to the English medium university, or they could move to, from university to one, in one country to another country, where again, all of these could apply. So lots of different possible transitions that uh, students go through. Okay, and to close, I'll just uh, point to some of the main things that I uh, hope I've made. So one is that using this small culture paradigm has the advantage because it focuses on specific, uh, concrete, local, not abstract. And I think perhaps counterintuitively, focusing on this small gives us a better way to compare things if we're interested in looking at comparison. Defining the scope of culture in this way uh, is also a way to overcome problems of miscommunication. So we know exactly what we're talking about if we all say, oh, I mean institutional, not national. 
differences do exist. I'm not saying that we're all equal. Of course, there are differences in the way we write in different languages. We use different pronouns. We use different reporting verbs and so on. Uh, and they will continue to exist. But we shouldn't explain them immediately by saying, oh, that's because they are like this or like that. So traits of national character really are not very helpful in explaining things. Uh, so what we should look at is more wider context, history, rhetorical tradition, to see why these conventions arise. And finally, what is different or similar itself is not something that's fixed. Uh, it's also something that changes. It's just that we may not actually see it because these changes are slow. Although I, we do see a lot of changes because changes are becoming faster and faster. And I'll stop here and uh, wait for your questions. Thank you.